reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wharton tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello and welcome to PMQ's Live with me, Gloria DiPiero. In just a few minutes, Boris Johnson will face MPs in his first proper public appearance since 40% of his own MPs voted against him in Monday's confidence vote. Will they be cheering him on today or stonily silent? I have a fantastic political panel with me in the studio, Nigel Mills, the Conservative MP for Amber Valley, and Rupert Huck, the Labour MP for Ealing Central and Acton. We'll get their analysis and that of our political editor, Darren McCaffrey, in Westminster. And let me know what you make of PMQ today. Email me at gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet me at gbnews. So, yes, it's Wednesday. It's seven minutes to 12. That means PMQs will soon be underway. But first, we're going to talk to my fantastic panel. In the studio with me, Conservative MP for Amber Valley, Nigel Mills, and Labour MP for Ealing Central and Acton, Rupert Hook. Welcome to the show, both of you. So, Nigel, if you had a Prime Minister's question uh, today, what would you be putting to him? I, mean, I always go with local issues. I think I, I don't think I'd be mentioning Monday's uh, votes in the chamber to his face like that again today. Uh, so, I think the, the, in the pressing things people are asking me about are people being desperate for passports to go on a holiday at the weekend. I mean, there's loads of people who are just stuck hoping it's going to turn up. Uh, all there's access to dentists or GP services. I, mean, I think those are the issues that are most pressing yeah. locally. So Interesting. One of those. Interesting. And we'll come back to um, talking about the NHS um, after Pim Hughes, because Sajid Javid will be making a statement on that today. Rupert Hook, um, what would you be asking the Prime Minister today? It would be tempting to stick the knife in about his confidence motion and say that, you know, the uh, margin worse than Theresa May's one when Jacob Rees Mogg, your chief cheerleader, was saying it's not good enough. You know, this is even worse than hers. Why are you still here? But, and you can't say you, as you know, Gloria, in the chamber. You'd yes, be... you're not allowed to direct. It's got to be the, the honourable gentleman. In the third person. But like Nigel, I like going on local. And I like doing a question where actually you could get a constructive answer. Mm. When people say, you know, isn't he fantastic? I just think, what a waste of a question. So I had someone who came to my advice surgery who's a medical student. They're a UK national, but they actually went to... Uh, Ukraine to do their studies and they were at Dnipro Medical Institute. Their mum managed to get them out before the war started. But the thing is, I think he's four-fifths of the way qualified. Gosh. And those qualifications are useless here. Really? And we've got an NHS with staffing shortages. So if they could just do some sort of conversion. So that could be something useful and constructive to help our NHS. Yeah, that's really interesting. I might ask that, something that like that. That is really interesting. Uh, Nigel, I hate to take you back to Monday. <laughs> it's a long time ago. <laughs> uh, you voted uh, no confidence in the Prime Minister. How does he win you all back? Well, it's a challenge, isn't it? I mean, you know, you, if people take the big step of not having confidence in him on, on Monday, it's not an easy thing he can just do. And it, it, it's not like it was a simple policy divide and you could change the policy. It, it, it was wider than that. It's kind of like different strands of the party. I mean, I, I think what he needs to do is get on with delivering his manifesto, get back to the kind of radical Boris that he was promising two and a half years ago, that perhaps got a bit lost in in COVID, get on with levelling up, get on with, you know, tackling some of the uh, establishment problems we all know we have, get on with growing the economy, sort out the cost of living crisis. But I think real, you know, rapid action on those sort of things, I think, would be his, his best mm. chance of getting some momentum back. That's what I'd be trying to do in his position at the moment. But I can, I can see he'd be tempted to go very cautious until the summer and avoid any, any difficult votes. You remember the, those first six months of 2019 when we almost had no votes in Parliament other than Brexit ones because Theresa yes. May didn't dare do anything. I, yes. I can't see Boris doing that. It didn't strike me as his character to run away and hide for a few weeks and see if it all goes away. I think he'll do some... And that's why the is, is he safe now with you? Is he on probation with, with people like you, Conservative MPs, who did vote to have no confidence with him on Monday and, and you did very well, but although he, he, he won. But is he on probation or are you like, right, we've done it once, that's it, you're, you're here to stay? I mean, he won. Uh, so in any democratic process, you kind of have to respect the result. Uh, so in theory, he's got a year without any more votes and people might try and change that, I suppose. But I, I think... I think what the country now expects is serious government for serious times. And I think the idea of 
you're going on strike or refusing to vote for government legislation to try and force a change is just totally irresponsible. This isn't student politics. We're running the country. Yeah. Uh, you know, we now have to let him get on and do the things he needs to do to tackle all these crises. He needs to have confidence if he's doing the right thing, he's got a majority in Parliament. Mm. So when I'm happy to say, you know, I'm happy to support him in delivering the policies we need to see. Uh, let's see if he can find a way out of this. I mean, if anyone can, it's, it's Boris. He's got out of many a scrape, would have finished off many a politician. So this, this, uh, this is very true. Life, this is very true. History suggests that it's difficult uh, to uh, come back after you've lost a no confidence, but perhaps Boris Johnson is the one person, as you, as you say, who can defy the historical rules. Rupert, what's the mood like on the Labour benches? Because, of course, Keir Starmer and Angela Rayner, you have this police investigation over the Durham gathering. How, how anxious are are you all about that? I mean, I think it does show the difference between Keir Starmer and Boris Johnson that, you know, he's him and Angela have held themselves, Starmer and Rayner, to a higher standard, saying that if the Durham police investigation comes out that he's broken the law, they've broken the law, they'll go. Hands up, that's it, the game's up. Uh, whereas Boris Johnson just looks like he's clinging on by his fingernails. I can't imagine... I mean, he's waited all his life to get here. I can't imagine him relinquishing that pretty quickly. Uh, I think, you know, they'll have to drag him out kicking and screaming. And respect to Nigel as a Conservative MP with guts. Uh, I mean, in some respects, we should be rubbing our hands together with glee, but we have these multiple crises now, cost of living crisis, NHS crisis, six million people on waiting lists, travel crisis, you name it. And we've got this Conservative Party that are like ferrets in a sack and a government who's paralysed. I mean... Mm. They just seem to be, you know, I mean, what is Johnsonism other than just his own self-preservation? The fact that he once wrote a column for staying in the EU, for leaving the EU, tossed the court. You know, he can be anything you want. When he was mayor of London, he was, he wanted an amnesty for illegal immigrants. Now they've got this Rwanda policy. He seems your flexible friend. And just, I think they've got to a point where they've just been in too long. Tax cuts might be on, on the way. Is that something that your constituents would welcome what we, we read that lots of pressure is on him from um, Conservative MPs to, to bring down tax as people are in pain, as, as Rupert said, and I'm sure you accept. No, absolutely. I mean, I, I think he could have chosen tax cuts rather than the uh, announcements for the cost of living crisis of giving people £400 and all the other measures. I think we're hugely welcome. He could have chosen tax cuts at that point, you know, reduce income tax, reduce VAT on fuel bills or petrol, go further down those lines. I mean, having spent tens of billions like basically giving people money rather than reducing taxes. I mean, it's only two weeks ago. It's hard to believe it's only a fortnight ago they made that announcement. Uh, I, I can't see where you have the room in the, in the spending. I mean, we, we came to power 12 years ago to sort out the country's finances. I mean, just, you know, having large tax cuts to save the Prime Minister and go and borrow the money to fund them doesn't feel like a particularly conservative thing to do. So... Because when you and I came, and we were elected at the same time, it was, it was pretty much neighbouring... Um, seats and it was all about austerity, living within your means. And actually, the, the, the Conservatives won elections on that basis, but you never, never really talk about the deficit or living within your means anymore. It's... No, I mean, Covid destroyed the public finances. We're still running We're going to deficit, repeat so. MQs. It's the Speaker is about to start Prime Minister's Question Time. ...is available to watch on Parliament Live TV. We now start with questions to Prime Minister Dame Angela Riedel. Yeah. One. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, this week is Carers Week and I'm sure the whole House will want to join me in thanking the millions of carers across the UK for all they do to support their loved ones. We've seen the vital role carers have played in our communities during the pandemic and we all owe them a debt of gratitude. Through our reforms on adult social care, this Government is committed to continuing to support carers. And Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Dame Angela Riedel. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. May I associate myself with the Prime Minister's remarks about the importance of carers in our country. Uh, this week's events, uh, Mr Speaker, have demonstrated just how loathed this Prime Minister is. Yeah. Yeah. And that's only in his own party. <laughs> so as his administration is too distracted by its internal divisions to deal with the challenges we face, can the Prime Minister explain if 148 
of his own backbenchers don't trust him, why on earth should the country? Prime Minister. Uh, well, I, I, thank, I thank the Right Honourable Lady very much for her question, and I can assure her that uh, in a long uh, political career so far, I have, of course, picked up, so, uh, barely begun, I have, of course, picked up political opponents all over the place. Yeah. And that is because, it's, it's, and that is because uh, this government has done some very big and very remarkable things, uh, which they did not necessarily approve of. And I, what I want her to know is that absolutely nothing and no one, uh, least of all her, is going to stop us with getting on uh, for delivering uh, for the British people. Yeah. Andrew Mitch. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The whole House will unite behind the Prime Minister on his determination to hold Ukrainian war criminals to account. But is he aware that there are five alleged Rwandan war crimes perpetrators living freely in the UK who have been doing so now for 16 years and have neither been extradited nor put before the British courts under our existing laws? As he prepares to go down to the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Rwanda, will he look carefully at this issue, because it is bound to be raised with him, and will he reassure the House and the Rwandan Government he takes these matters extremely seriously, and what has so far been justice massively delayed for 16 years will not be grotesquely denied? Prime Minister. Uh, I thank my right honourable friend for his question, and he uh, he raises an issue uh, on which uh, the UK has campaigned for a long time, and no, one, no country is more committed uh, than we are to bringing uh, war criminals to justice. I know that my right honourable friend, the Deputy Prime Minister, uh, has raised the subject recently uh, with the International Criminal Court. Uh, uh, however, as he knows, and I will certainly, of course, uh, study the case and, uh, and take it up as, as appropriately, it is the subject of an ongoing uh, investigation. Uh, it would not be appropriate uh, for me to comment on it further. We now come to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Thank, thank you, Mr Speaker. I, I, I couldn't make out whether that introductory noise was cheers or boos. <laughs> I joined. The, the trouble is, I don't know whether it's directed at me or him. <laughs> I joined the Prime Minister in his comments about carers. Why did his culture secretary, I think, hiding Delicious. along the bench, <laughs> say that successive, successive, su successive Conservative governments left our health service wanting and inadequate exactly. yep. when the pandemic hit? Yeah. 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 Mister. Mr Speaker, everybody knows that when the pandemic hit, uh, it was an entirely novel it was an entirely novel virus for which the whole world uh, was unprepared. Uh, and nobody knew nobody at that stage nobody knew how to uh, test for it. Uh, nobody knew what the right uh, quarantine rules should be, Mr Speaker. But as it happened, uh, the UK government and our amazing NHS uh, our amazing NHS Produced not only approved, not only approved the first vaccine anywhere in the world. We were the first to get it into anybody's arms, Mr. Speaker, and we had the fastest rollout anywhere in Europe. None of which would have been possible if we'd listened to him. I think the Prime Minister just agreed with the Culture Secretary. Perhaps she said it. He didn't deny it. Perhaps. Perhaps she said it because it's true. Yeah. Exactly. It starts with GPs. People were unhappy with the service they were getting before the pandemic. Yeah. Not enough GPs. Yeah. Too hard to get an appointment. That's why he promised 6,000 new GPs. But his health secretary admits he won't keep that promise. Yeah. No. Despite the hard work of doctors, people can't see a GP in person. They are unhappier than ever with GP services. If GP provision was wanting and inadequate before the pandemic, what is it now? 
<laughs> Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, I'm afraid he's simply wrong because uh, what this uh, uh, he's wrong about what we're doing. Uh, uh, and of course, Mr. We've got to, we've got to clear the COVID backlogs, and everybody understands that. Everybody understands. Uh, everybody understands the pressure. Uh, that the NHS is under, but they are responding magnificently, and I can tell him uh, that uh, thanks to the investments that this government has put in, uh, we now have 4,300 more doctors. Uh, we have record numbers. We have record numbers in uh, in training, uh, and I, to the best of my we have 11,800 more nurses this year than last year, Mr. Speaker, and 72,000 72, in training, and that is because of the investment uh, that we put in, uh, which was opposed by the party opposite. And the only reason we were able to make that investment, Mr Speaker, is because we have a strong and robust economy, thanks, thanks to the decisions we took. So Mr Speaker, he, of course he talks big, but I've got a letter here to the Prime Minister from the Honourable Member from Hereford and South Herefordshire. He said this is you, Prime Minister. Under you, the government seems to lack a sense of mission. Yeah. It has a large majority, but no long-term plan. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister's Big Plan Act is so tired that even once loyal MPs don't believe him. Yeah. And it's not just waiting for a GP. Yeah. It's waiting for all NHS treatment. Yeah. Yeah. Take cancer. For over a decade, Waiting times for cancer care have been going up. His solution was supposed to be diagnostic hubs. The Health Secretary has been on a victory lap this week. But here's the rub, Prime Minister. Since they were opened last year, 135,000 extra people are now waiting for scans and tests. Can he think of a better way to describe soaring cancer waiting lists? Than wanting an inadequate. Yeah. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it is, in, it is entirely right after the pandemic that people are now coming forward to get their, their cancer tests, and, and, and we, have, we have actively encouraged that, and that is, the, that is the right thing for people to do. But as a result of the community diagnostic hubs uh, that we are bringing in, a hundred of them across the country, uh, Mr Speaker, we are able to cut the times uh, for cancer diagnosis, help people to get their scans, uh, their tests faster, and, and above all, we can do that, Mr Speaker, because we are hiring more radiographers, we are hiring more nurses, we are hiring more professionals in our NHS because of the investments that we made, which, as I say, the party of Bevan tragically opposed. Yeah. Yes, Mr Speaker, the problem is the cancer weights have been going up for 10 years, yeah. and they are even higher now. So blaming the pandemic just won't wash. Perhaps the Culture Secretary was talking about the state of NHS buildings. Before the pandemic, the NAO said they were a risk to patients. The government's response, paint jobs and fix-ups, pretending that's the same as building new hospitals. The Treasurer and the Cabinet Office apparently don't think that the refurbs are even going to be delivered. Take University Hospital North Tees. The ceiling is falling in, the roof leaks, and staff have to hose down the pipes to stop them freezing over. Failure to fix wanting and inadequate NHS buildings is putting patients at risk, isn't it, Prime Minister? Mr Speaker, this, this line of uh, criticism is satirical, coming from a, from a Labour a Labour government a, a, a Labour, he's a, a, a la attacking our attacking our hospital building programme, Mr Speaker. Where they, they were the authors of they were the authors of the PFI scheme that bankrupted so many hospitals. They were uh, they, uh, they uh, Mr Speaker, we, what we're doing instead is building 48 new hospitals. Yes, we are. Uh, thanks to the thanks to the coloss the biggest capital investment program in the history of the NHS. Uh, and, and we, we put, uh, from memory, we put 33 billion pounds as soon as we came in. Then another 92 uh, to cope with the pandemic, plus another 39 billion in the health and care levy. They opposed. They opposed that funding. They opposed the health and care levy. 
they don't have a leg to stand on. We're building the foundations of our NHS's, our, our health services' future, and they should support it. Can I just say to both of you, you need to calm down, and there's two over here as well. The four of you could have a very nice cup of tea if you wish. Kiss them. Oh dear. Prime Minister. <laughs> dear, dear, dear. Prime Minister. Pre pre well, pretending. <laughs> Mr. Speaker. Pre pre pretending no rules were broken. Prime Minister, he chunters on. Pretending no rules were broken didn't work. Pretending the economy is booming didn't work. And pretending to build 40 new hospitals won't work either. They want him to change, but he can't. As always with this Prime Minister, when he's falling short, he just changes the rules and lowers the bar. In March, he proposed changing the NHS contract. He wants to double the length of time patients can be made to wait for surgery, from one year to two years. On top of that, he scrapped zero tolerance of 12-hour waits at A&E. 24 hours at A&E used to be a TV programme. Now it's his policy. Well, it's Health Week. And he, he's telling all of them. Order! <laughs> Mr Cleverly, we've got a tea party gathering. I'm sure you don't want to be part of it. I will hear the question. The problem is, so do our constituents. I wonder if I were you, and I think one or two of you might be going early. What I would say is, look, I need to hear the question in the same way I expect to hear the answer. So please, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I, I bet they wish they were this organised on Monday. <laughs> uh, well, Mr Speaker, it's Health Week, and he's telling them he's going to turn over a new leaf. So why doesn't he start by scrapping his plans to greenlight wanting and inadequate NHS standards? Yeah. Prime Minister. In the field, Mr Speaker, uh, look, he's, uh, I've got to tell you, I, I just think this, this line of attack is not working, uh, Mr Speaker. <laughs> but it's not, it's not working... It's not working because it's not working because they refuse to approve. Once again, I think the two of you need to calm down. So please, we don't. Hang on, we don't want to see an empty front bench, Prime Minister. Look, uh, we've not only raised the standards uh, in the NHS, uh, we're not only reducing uh, waiting times for those uh, who have had to wait the longest, Mr Speaker, but what we're doing more fundamentally is doing what the people of this country can see is simple common sense, and that is using our economic strength to invest in doctors and nurses and get people on the ward, get people, uh, give, give, giving people their scans and their screens and their tests in a more timely manner and getting uh, and taking our NHS forward. We are on target, Mr Speaker, to, uh, thanks to this Government, to recruit 50,000 more nurses. Thanks to, thanks to the investments, I'm just going to repeat this, because he doesn't seem to have heard it so far, thanks to the investments that that party opposed. Perhaps he can now explain why they opposed them. Mr Speaker, raising taxes because you fail to grow the economy isn't a plan for the NHS, yeah. and everyone sitting behind him knows it. Members of this Cabinet admit that Conservatives left our health system wanting and inadequate when the pandemic hit. Yeah. He's been in power for three years, and things are getting worse, not better. Yeah. Fewer GPs, more waits for cancer tests, buildings still crumbling, and he's changing the rules to cover up his failure. And there is a real human pain as a result. Today I spoke to Hamza Semakula. Hamza is 20 and he plays semi professional football for Hendon. He tore his ACL earlier this year. Because of the two year wait for surgery, he had to crowdfund for a private operation. I also spoke to Akshay Patel. Last year, his mother woke up unable to breathe. Akshay called 999 six times. In his last call, he said, 
I rang an hour ago for an ambulance as she had difficulty breathing, and now she's dead. Even he must admit that Akshay, Bina and Hamza deserve better than a wanting and inadequate government utterly unable to improve our NHS. Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, I think everybody in the House has uh, sympathy with uh, Akshay and uh, the other constituents and, the, and their families and the, the other constituents uh, that, he, that he mentions, Mr Speaker, and, uh, and, and I, 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 I share uh, their, their feelings. But uh, when you look at what this government is doing, uh, the massive and, and, I, and I, I must say this to him, uh, we are making colossal investments in our NHS. Uh, we are cutting waiting times, uh, we are raising standards, we are paying nurses more, we are supporting our fantastic NHS. And by the way, he continually came to this. I'm not going to remind him of this and said that we had the worst COVID record in Europe. It turned out to be completely untrue. Uh, he, still he, still, he, still, he, still hasn't re- he still hasn't retracted it. We're doing it, Mr Speaker. We're make, we can make those investments because of the strength of the UK economy, because of the fiscal firepower that we have to deploy. We have the lowest unemployment now since 1974, and we are going to continue to grow our economy for the long term. He asked about, he asked about the mission of this government, Mr Speaker. It is to unite and level up across our whole country, to unleash unleash the potential of our entire country, the biggest tutoring programme in history for young people, raising literacy and numeracy standards uh, for 11-year-olds from 65 per cent adequacy to 90 per cent. That is the highest objective I think a government could achieve. Expanding home ownership for millions of people, as my right honourable friend uh, Fadulu and I will do, uh, for millions of people who currently don't have it, cutting the costs of... No, cutting the costs of business to make this the enterprise centre of Europe. That is our vision, creating high-wage, high-skilled jobs for this country. And as for jobs, I'm going to get on with mine, and I hope he gets on with his. (laughs) But I didn't know you were so popular. Come on! We love all of Changing the, the subject completely, in North East Hertfordshire, we're very concerned about sewage overflows into our <laughs> precious short street. And uh, this is damaging to the flora and fauna and also restricts the use of these precious streams for leisure. The, the Environment Bill included some important measures last year, and I, I welcome the fact that the government has consulted on its reduction plan for storm overflows, but when when would we expect to see some meaningful improvements and some real reductions in the amount of sewage going into our rivers? Yeah, well, I, I thank you very much, and I, I share his concern. I can tell him our sewage plan is the biggest investment on this by any uh, by any government. We made it clear that uh, the water companies uh, must uh, do more, Mr. Speaker. And actually, we already are seeing improvements, but uh, the regulator is ensuring that the water companies uh, do more to deliver on their obligations. We will not hesitate to take further action as needed. We now come to the leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I associate myself with the remarks of the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition in supporting our carers? Mr Speaker, week after week I have called on this Prime Minister to resign. I have been met with a wall of noise from the Tory benches. I thought they were trying to shout me down, but all this time... This time, Mr. Speaker, it turns out that 41% of them have been cheering me on. Because, Mr. Speaker, let's be clear: at least the numbers don't lie. 41% of his own MPs have no confidence in him. 66 of MPs across the House don't support him, and 97% of Scottish MPs want the Minister for the Union shown the door. Duck Prime Minister presiding over a divided party in a disunited kingdom. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. how does the Prime Minister 
expect to continue when even unionist leaders in Scotland won't back him. Prime Minister. I, I, want, I want to thank my, uh, uh, right, the right honourable gentleman for his characteristic uh, warm words. Uh, and, uh, just, uh, and, uh, and actually, Mr. Speaker, I, wa- I want to say that the, the biggest and most powerful and effective advocate of the United Kingdom over the last uh, time that I've been in, 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 in has been that man there. Yeah. He's going to last uh, here as, as leader of the SNP. The Scottish Catholic Westminster. Long may, uh, long may he rest in place, Mr. Speaker. He is the Araldite that's keeping our kingdom uh, together. I, I thank him for what he's doing. Blackburn. Well, I, I can see, I can see to the Prime Minister. I can say to the Prime Minister that I'll be standing shoulder to shoulder with our First Minister as we take our country to independence. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister is acting like Monty Python's Black Knight, running around declaring it's just a flesh wound. And no amount, no amount of delusion and denial will save the Prime Minister from the truth. This story won't go away until he goes away. For once in his life, he needs to wake up to reality. Prime Minister, it's over. It's done. The Prime Minister has no options left, but Scotland does. Scotland has the choice of an independent future. Because it's not just the Prime Minister that we have zero confidence in. It's the broken Westminster system that puts a man like him in power. Can he tell us? Can the Prime Minister tell us how it is democratic that Scotland is stuck with a Prime Minister we don't trust? a Conservative Party we don't support, and Tory governments we haven't voted for since 1955. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, we had a, we had a, a referendum, as I've uh, told the House before, uh, in, in 2014. I think he should respect the mandate of the, uh, of the people. And you know, he, keeps saying, he keeps saying that uh, he, 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 he's, he wants his independence for his country. Our country is independent, yeah. uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, our country is independent. He, he tried 48 times to reverse it to the, 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 the opposition. And the only way that independence would ever be reversed is if we had the disaster, Mr. Speaker, of a Labour SNP coalition to take us back into the EU. Mr. Mike May. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Earlier this week, the Prime Minister said you cannot spend your way out of inflation, you cannot tax your way into growth. We will cut the cost of government. Here, here, I completely agree. So when can I suggest a strong start that he scraps the inflated white elephant that is HS2, saving, saving the government tens of billions of pounds from a budget that is spiralling out of control? Prime Minister. Uh, I, I, I thank my right honourable friend. I, 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 in case you missed what, el- what, what else I said, uh, we're cutting taxes, Mr. Speaker, yep. uh, for everybody who pays national insurance uh, contributions by an average of £330, uh, Mr. Speaker, just next month. And as for, as for HS2, actually what it will do is deliver long term growth and prosperity uh, for the whole of the country, uh, uniting and levelling up, deliver more revenues, uh, and, and, give, and put us in a better position uh, to cut taxes in the future. Colin Beeswell. Speaker, today we hear reports that the Prime Minister refused to consult the First Treasury Council on his plans to rip up uh, the protocol. Now, I know this question might be a bit redundant given he might not be around uh, very much longer. Uh, but given the Prime Minister's casual uh, record of casual uh, law breaking, uh, will he give a commitment to the people of Northern Ireland that he will not break international law any time soon? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I can tell him that. Uh, uh, the, the reports that he has seen this morning are not uh, correct, and I, what I can also tell him uh, is that the most important commitment that I think everybody in this House uh, uh, has made is to the, uh, the balance and symmetry of the Belfast Good Friday uh, Agreement. Uh, that, is, that is our, our highest uh, legal international priority, and that is what we must deliver. Dr James Davis. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The yeah. North Wales mainline railway has seen little investment for over a century. In practice, this means that jobs at Manchester Airport are poorly accessible to many of my constituents with a two-hour commute. 
whereas a similar journey in the southeast of the country would be just 45 minutes. So will my right hon. Friend ensure that the North Wales line features within the updated rail network enhancements pipeline at the decision to develop stage? Yeah. 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 Yes. Uh, I, I, I thank my uh, my right. and listen, I, I'm a great enthusiast, Mr. Speaker, for this project. Uh, I, we are looking at it, and I can tell him that the uh, Network Rail has received funding to carry, the, uh, carry out feasibility work uh, on improving North Wales' uh, mainline uh, journey times, and uh, uh, travellers in North Wales could have no more uh, effective advocate uh, than my old friend. Kim yeah. 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 Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Despite the Prime Minister's promises of new hospitals and more doctors and nurses, the Bronte Birth Centre at my local hospital in Batley and Spen is temporarily shut and is at risk of permanent closure due to staff shortages and lack of resources. Oh. The reality on the ground is that after 12 years of Conservative mismanagement, the NHS is broken. Yeah. Yeah. So can the Prime Minister explain to expectant parents in my constituency why, despite his promises, they are now forced to travel miles to give birth? and why his government voted against an effective long-term workforce plan for the NHS, proposed by his right honourable friend, the member for South West Surrey. Yeah. Yeah. Minister. I thank her very much, and I, I will certainly look into what's the, the, the centre that she mentions in Batley and Spen. What I can tell her, though, uh, what I can tell her is that uh, across the country, uh, we are we are looking, we are investing massively in staff, uh, in premises, uh, in technology, in diagnostic centres, uh, and, 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 it's, and I'm afraid for the party opposite to, to carp and to criticise is frankly absurd because they voted against uh, the health and care levy that is putting billions uh, into our NHS and, and they, they need to sort out their position. Either they support it or they don't. Hold on. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, would my right honourable friend join me in complimenting Bradford on becoming the City of Culture in 2025? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Could he also praise the team from Durham who give a fantastic representation of what County Durham had to offer? Bradford must really be extraordinary to have beaten us. <laughs> in, in 2025, Durham will also celebrate the bicentennial of the Stockton to Darlington passenger railway, which will of course distract people from Bradford. <laughs> I believe that my right of old friend is the best person to lead on delivering levelling up for the North East. Yeah. Yeah. And to that end, can he encourage progress on the Furry Hill station development, reinvigorate the Leam side line, yep. and help deliver a great county deal for County Durham? Yes, yes. Yeah. I thank, I thank my, my honourable friend, and he and I uh, have campaigned on. I've been, I've been following his campaign on this for. Uh, for a, a long time, Mr. Speaker, uh, I am told that the Department of Transport is currently reviewing the business case for exactly uh, what he uh, has just uh, requested. Uh, we're putting the funding in, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, unlike anything the party opposite ever could have delivered. Richard Thompson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In Monday's confidence vote, the Prime Minister secured the support of just two out of Scotland's 59 MPs. That means out of the mass ranks of his Scottish Conservative colleagues, he got as much support as there are pandas in Edinburgh Zoo. <laughs> the Prime Minister is an intelligent man. He must know that position is untenable. And if he's not going to do the decent thing and resign as the Prime Minister, surely it's past time he wrote a letter of resignation to himself to stand down as the Minister for the Union. Yeah. Prime Minister. I thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. I re look, I really, I really uh, redirect the honourable gentleman to uh, what I said to uh, the right honourable gentleman, uh, my friend, uh, the leader of the SNP, <laughs> uh, because uh, I, I think the more the more they campaign in the current circumstances for breaking up our United Kingdom with all the strength and all the merits uh, that it has, I, I think the more damage they do to their own case. Greg Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Supporting adults with a variety of mental health challenges, learning disabilities and conditions such as dementia. Last week, the Prince's Centre in Prince's Risborough in my constituency celebrated 10 years as an independent daycare provider. From my recent visit, it is quite clear what a happy, welcoming and supportive atmosphere has been created for all 
service users. So, will my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, join me in thanking and congratulating the manager, Kim Challoner, her whole team of staff, volunteers, and trustees for delivering this first class service? And as Chequers is but a hop, skip, and a jump from Prince's Risborough, will he deliver those congratulations in person? Prime Minister. Uh, well, I, I, I thank my honourable friend, who is amongst his many other distinctions, I think my, my MP. Uh, and uh, I, I, join, I also join him in thanking uh, the entire team at the Princess uh, Centre for everything that they do, and I will certainly keep his kind invitation uh, in mind. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd have more sympathy for the words get, the, get on with the job if it actually started in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> Ago, two weeks ago, the Prime Minister told the House, to the best of my knowledge, everybody is getting their passport within four to six weeks. However, the passport office is currently quoting a 10-week service time, with many of my constituents waiting well over that period. Cancelled summer trips could cost families over £1 billion. Does the Prime Minister accept that the passport office backlog is placing additional pressure on families already struggling with the cost of living crisis? Actually, Mr. Speaker, what uh, uh, we're doing is uh, uh, 91% are getting their passport within six weeks, I can tell him, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, and we are putting hundreds and hundreds more staff into the passport office. Uh, and and the, the strength of demand, by the way, is a sign of the robustness of the economy because everybody uh, is, is frankly wanting to go on holiday, and, and, and quite right too, Mr. Speaker. But when, he, when it comes to travel chaos, when it comes to travel chaos, have we heard any condemnation yet from the, from the, from the opposition, from the RMT and their reckless and wanton strike? What about that? Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As my right honourable friend knows, Rochester and Strood is facing unrealistic housing targets, putting pressure on the council to bring forward a local plan that will close successful working docks and the loss of beloved open spaces such as Dean Gate Ridge, all in the name of meeting an arbitrary target. Can my right honourable friend assure my constituents who are facing this level of overdevelopment that there will be greater flexibility on housing numbers so that the council can produce a local plan that delivers the appropriate housing but protects important sites like these? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I thank my, uh, my honourable friend, and, and she speaks, I know, uh, for, for, for colleagues up and down uh, the country. We want to make sure that councils are able uh, to build uh, in the right place and uh, sensitively to. Uh, to local needs, and, and that is what uh, we insist on. Uh, but I just want to make it one thing absolutely clear. Part of the, the merit, the genius of levelling up, Mr Speaker, is that it will encourage us uh, to take some of the pressure, yeah. some of the heat out of uh, the south-east of England, which has been overburdened uh, for decades, and we can do it. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My constituent, Mark, is trying to sponsor two sisters from Ukraine to come to the UK. These two sisters were housed in dangerous temporary accommodation in Montenegro for several weeks while the UK Home Office refused to process the application of the younger sister because she's 13 and travelling without her parents, even though she had her 18-year-old sister with her. The 18-year-old sister is now in London and the 13-year-old sister has been sent back to her hometown in Ukraine, which is under siege. Can I ask the Prime Minister, can he tell me, hand on heart, does he think sending vulnerable children back to a war zone is the right policy? Well, Mr Speaker, of course I, uh, I understand the, uh, the, her indignation about the case that she uh, that she mentions, and, uh, and I know that my right from the Home Secretary will be, uh, will be looking into it. But I have to say, I do think the record of this country uh, in processing so far, I think well over 100,000, uh, 120,000 uh, visas uh, for Ukrainians, is, is very creditable. I thank all the staff uh, who have been involved in that effort. Mr. Speaker, my right friend will remember that in March I asked him about increased research funding 
for aortic dissection as called for by the Aortic Dissection Charitable Trust. Will the Prime Minister update me on the progress with this? Will he also recognise the immense value of the patient awareness videos that have been produced by TADCT featuring Whispering Bob Harris, survivors, relatives of patients, to help those going through this awful condition for the first time? Prime Minister. Uh, well, I thank my honourable friend for her fantastic work on this, and I know uh, the personal circumstances that uh, that uh, give her understanding of this uh, of this campaign. I can I can tell her that uh, the National Institute for Health Research is uh, looking at what more we can do uh, to support research on aortic uh, dissection. I know that uh, she's meeting my right honourable friend, uh, the Health Secretary, shortly. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Ukrainian Freedom Orchestra and the Kyiv Symphony Orchestra are due to visit the UK this summer to perform at the BBC Proms, the Edinburgh Festival and other venues. But while other European countries are waiving their visas, to get to the UK the musicians are facing both visa delays and prohibitive visa costs of 18,000 and 10,000 respectively. We should be doing all we can to support these Ukrainian musicians. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So will the Prime Minister match our European neighbours and enable these Ukrainian artists to tour to the UK this year by expediting their visa applications and waiving the visa fees? Yeah. She, I think she needs to bring the particular case to, uh, to my right honourable friend. But I can tell, I can, t- I can tell, I can tell the House of what they know, and I know that many honourable members, by the way, are showing a lead uh, by having uh, Ukrainians to stay in their own homes. I thank all honourable members for doing it. Thanks to the scheme that the UK government has put in place, I think we should be very proud of what we're doing. <laughs> Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister knows from his visits to Redford and Cleveland that we enjoy miles of beautiful, uninterrupted coastline. However, since October last year, we have seen thousands of dead and dying crustaceans wash ashore. DEFRA constru- conducted an investigation into this, which led to the theory of algal bloom being the primary cause for these deaths. However, this report does nothing to support the fishermen left de- devastated by this freak event through no fault of their own. Will the Prime Minister look at how he can support yes. this yes. vital industry to get them back on their yes. feet? Yes. Yes. Minister. Uh, I, I know my, uh, my honourable friend and I were walking together on the, the seafront uh, in, in Red Car when, uh, when, when I, eating, a, eating a lemon top, actually, Mr. Speaker, uh, when somebody raised this very point uh, with us. And, uh, I, and I can tell him. Uh, that we've ruled out uh, chemical pollution, uh, Mr. Speaker, but we are we are looking at uh, we are making another 100 million pounds of investment, uh, including uh, in communities such as his, and working with uh, the fishing industry to help them uh, recover from this problem. Final question, Kenny McCaskill. Yeah, yeah. The poorest in this country currently pay the highest fuel costs through prepayment meters that have higher standing charges and higher tariffs. Belgium ensures a social tariff for the poorest and most vulnerable as the perverse and pernicious euphemism of self-disconnection enters the lexicon, when in fact it is a politically imposed choice, not something chosen by individuals. Is it not time that we provided a social tariff and ended the injustice of prepayment meters? Prime Minister. Uh, I, I, I thank him, um, Mr. Speaker, and I can, I can tell him that what we're uh, doing in the uh, immediate, uh, what we're doing right, right now, uh, is helping uh, eight million families, eight million households across the country with £1,200 of support, a uh, uh, three, uh, three, uh, £300 uh, for pensioners who are in receipt of the cold weather payment. Plus uh, four hundred pounds, Mr. Speaker, uh, for every household in the country, uh, and, and that is the support that we're giving right now uh, to help people with the cost of, of energy. And uh, the only reason we can do it, as I've as I've said uh, before to the House, is because of the strength of the economy uh, and because of the, 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 the brave, tough calls that we got right during the pandemic. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, that which we know. I think the honourable member has been here long enough to know it comes after statements. We don't need to tell him the rules of the House. Right. Welcome back. PMQs has ended. And with me now to go through how it went are my great panel, Nigel Mills, Conservative MP for Amber Valley and Rupert Hook, Labour MP for Ealing Central and Acton. Rupert. Keir Starmer should have wiped the floor with uh, the Prime Minister to say, 
felt a bit flat. I thought he did. <laughs> I mean, look, come on, I can't remember anything the Prime Minister said. He didn't come up with any of his normal zingers. And I don't know if it, it, he was trying to be serious, Boris, or something, but quite often when he did the statement after the Sue Gray report, he's given a serious script to read that says, I apologise profoundly. And then it takes a few minutes of questions and he loses his grip and then starts saying beer korma or whatever. There was nothing like that in there, whereas Keir Starmer from the off... Uh, when he got on his feet, he said, oh, I don't know if those are booze or cheers. Mm. I thought that was that was your line. That was the best line for, from your leader. You, well, he was full of them. The okay. thing about the 24 hours in A&E, that used to be a TV show. Now it's a policy, isn't it? I thought that was very good as well. Very loyal. Very loyal. And, uh, no. <laughs> I don't have to <laughs> make anything up, Gloria. Come on. No, so why are you laughing to me if I'm very loyal? <laughs> <laughs> the most... Uh, you're going to be equally as loyal to your leader, I am sure. Was that Boris Johnson at his best? Look, I think we've probably wanted Boris to become a bit more serious, statesmanlike, and a bit less of the kind of clown. I think he was trying that today. In a, in a difficult week for him, I don't think he was going to be his usual sort of like ebullient self. Uh, probably the best exchange was the one we had with the Ian Blackford, leader of the SNP. Who I think probably had better lines than Keir. I, I would and agree then, with uh, you. Um, uh, Boris had his line about you know about Ian being the best advocate for the UK and the Harold Dyke that's holding the union together. I think that was probably the most entertaining exchange of the. Of a lot, but I think uh, Boris and Keir really don't like each other. I think it's kind of hard. Do you think I, I, that's, I, I, do you I think, think that's actually real? Boris and Ian Blackford actually have a little bit of banter, and okay, it, it makes it probably easier just to you know, yeah. jest a bit rather. Than, I think there's not seriously no affection between the big two. Yeah, yeah. Um, there were some substantial issues uh, raised. Um, probably, well, actually, Keir Starmer did did raise the NHS. This is this is apparently we are told. Health Week, your Government Health Week, where you want to be talking about what um, fantastic things uh, you are going to do to improve an NHS, which I think everybody would agree is under strain. When I when I take you to your constituency, what's what, what's the big problem that your government need to nail first when it comes to our health service? And the issues that are raised most commonly will be access to dentists. I mean, trying to get an NHS dentist if you've not got one is almost impossible. Yes. And getting to see a GP as quickly as you'd like to, or at least as in person as you'd, as you'd like to, I think are the two that are the most common in my mail. But I think people are quite sympathetic. They know the NHS is under pressure with the pandemic backlogs. People, I think people are kind of willing to give it some slack, but I think we'd all like to see some progress being made tackling those. And it's, you know, it's just, you know, mm. we, we, I mean, we are now a few months from the end of all the restrictions. The NHS kept some probably for longer than they needed to. I think that's the progress we need to see, that real mm. momentum coming to, you know, to, to actually get people treated who've been waiting a long time. And if there had been a Labour government during the pandemic, the NHS would similarly be under strain. I think we'd have gone into it in a better state because we went into the... You can't blame everything on COVID, so we had record waiting lists staff shortages, uh, bed shortages, all that. So then we are in a weaker position when we went in, in the first place. And what I would say locally uh, is the big one that people ask me about is mental health, to be right. honest. Because I think there's 1.7 million people, is it, waiting for mental health appointments of some sort or other, especially CAMS, child and adult uh, yes. child, uh, yes. mental health services. I remember that. So that one, I think you have to wait years and years to get an appointment for those. And again, this pandemic's messed with everyone's head, but especially kids who their normal ecosystem of the school was taken away from them. Uh, so there's long waiting lists for young people to get mental health appointments. Um, I thought the passport chaos, uh, another question from the backbenchers, um, is that happening in your areas? Yeah, big time. Just a lady was phoning up the office yesterday. Her kid needs to go on a school trip for Friday. And she was saying, is it coming? I'm in Victoria. I'm in the queue now. They're saying that my MP can help me. Will you talk to them? Mm. But, yeah, I mean, passport chaos, the stuff at the airports, those pictures of queues, in, yeah, shocking mm. queues and cancelled flights and all that. It's a mess. We've got travel chaos. Big passport case because I, I, one thing I do remember from being an MP is, is there's, um, there's, a, there's a hotline that MPs can call, isn't there, for, on behalf of constituents. Is, does that still exist? It, it still exists. My staff love it when we get these because it's about an hour and a half wait to get through at the moment. So you kind of like the member of staff almost permanently in the queue. Trying so to even for, it, for the MPs line, it's, it's sort of nice. Yeah, it's incredibly slow and difficult. I mean, there's a huge demand and it's, it's, it is, you know, hot wrecking. So someone's not had a holiday for three years. They're, actually been waiting for a passport for more than the 10 weeks they're ever supposed to wait for. They've done the right thing, they'd applied in time, they didn't know there were these problems when they applied, and then can we get it through the system in time for a flight on Saturday or next Monday or something? You know, sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. And w 
we've been aware of this passport problems for really some, some months now, and we've had MPs on, on the show um, talking about it and talking about the problems with our constituents. When you... Because you must be able to ask the Transport Secretary or, you know, what's... But, you know, what, why can't... Why is it so difficult to get this nailed so people can have their summer holidays? Yeah, this is a Home Office one, this one, the ah. passports. But, okay. um, I mean, it's just... System overload, isn't it? I suppose I don't know whether it was. I think it was problems with the system, problems with resourcing the staff, but also problems people hadn't had to go away, so they hadn't been renewing passports. Then you suddenly find you, you've got more demand than you're expecting, and mm. you can't cope with it. I mean, it, it shouldn't get to this stage. It, 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 it was predicted actually. I think they tried to put some extra resource in, but probably not enough. And then. But it seems bonkers at a time like this that they're going to slash the civil service, and you know some of the policies they are coming up with. Things like the imperial measures. Nobody on a doorstep asks for that. You know, everyone knows they're waiting stones. We've got that anyway. On that one. Um, <laughs> does it, does it come up in, in? And the blue passports again. That's another thing. Yeah. What? But I think imperial measures is not a serious issue, is it? I mean, there are some people who are very angry about it. It's ridiculous that you can't sell stuff in pints or pounds. But I mean, I'm far too young to remember actually most of this. So uh, yeah. I, I don't think it's going to lead, exactly be a life changer for the Prime Minister to bring back pounds and ounces, but... Something that could be a life changing event for many people is the rail strikes. Now, before I, I, I start talking about rail strikes, most people in this country make their journeys by bus. So, and, uh, you know, it's, it's important to say Corbyn that. Jeremy Corbyn was but, pilloried for talking about buses, remember? But, <laughs> Well, and that was so, one thing he did go right. But so buses are not on strike, <laughs> um, but those rail strikes, um, people particularly who are going into cities in, in, in order to to work, particularly in, in in the capital, it's going to be incredibly difficult. There's a tube and a rail strike on on one of the days. Um, I mean, Rupert, the Labour Party has a close relationship with the trade unions, but. My goodness, this is this is ridiculous. Well, yeah, no, obviously we're a creature of the trade unions. We're the political wing of the trade union movement. But I think it's the government that we have to look to here because they just need to sort this out. Some heads need banging together. Everyone needs to get around the negotiating table, the unions, the rail operators, rail track, uh, all those different bits. And I don't know, I mean... Possibly, Conservatives are loving this because it's a chance to revert to union bashing and it feels like the 70s, doesn't it? Inflation, <laughs> imperial measures, strikes. All, all we need next is the three-day week and, and that's when I was conceived, when there was no electricity. <laughs> But anyway, um, I mean, this is utterly outrageous strike, isn't it? I mean, the, the rail industry would have collapsed if the government hadn't tipped billions and billions and billions of extra pounds in during the pandemic. Passenger numbers are still nowhere near the 100% what they were pre-pandemic, and actually, it's the commuting ones that are really still quite a lot lower. We need to find a way of having a railway system that's actually sustainable, delivering what passengers want, and in, isn't draining the taxpayer of. Thirteen billion pounds a year, whatever we've tipped in. So to have a strike at this point, before we've even worked out what the changes we're going to need, we all know we need them. I can't see what the unions are hoping to achieve, other than you know, making rail travel even less attractive to people than it than it already is. I, I think it's a terrible for the industry and terrible for the country. Dare we? Uh, do we dare to dream that Grant Shapps is going to sort of come to some sort of deal arrangement, anything to stop this happening? I, I just don't know because I don't think anybody knows what the union are actually striking against because there aren't any there aren't, there aren't any proposals pay. actually in place to make any changes. Yet surely everybody just has to accept that if passenger numbers, especially on commuter services into London, are below eighty percent of where they were, we can't just keep chucking money at it. So perhaps it would have been better off waiting to see what the changes might be and then thinking about action rather than being somewhat premature. <laughs> On the ground in Westminster is our political editor, Darren McCaffrey. Darren, what did you make of that? Yeah, really interesting, isn't it, Gloria? I think many people would have been surprised that Keir Starmer didn't go on the attack on that vote of confidence, of course, on Monday when 148 Conservative MPs voted against the Prime Minister. Many would have thought it was the political open goal uh, for the leader of the opposition uh, to do so. It's certainly something the SNP uh, went on and some backbenchers uh, too. But I think in the end, actually, it makes sense uh, for the Labour Party. There's nothing that unites... Uh, the Conservatives more than an attack from Labour in many ways. I'm sure Keir Starmer uh, views it as an internal Conservative battle and it's better to let that 
uh, stew, if you like. Interestingly, he went on health. It is Health Week proposed by the government. They're making lots of announcements on changing uh, the NHS. And Keir Starmer picked up on this line from the Dean Doris in a tweet to Jeremy Hunt about how the health service was before the pandemic. And clearly Labour feel that this is an issue uh, that plays well with the public. Let's have a little look at what the exchange was during PMQs. Mr Speaker, this, this line of uh, criticism is satirical, coming from a, from a Labour a Labour government a, a, a Labour, a, a la attacking, our, attacking our hospital building programme, Mr Speaker, where they, they, were the authors of, they were the authors of the PFI scheme that bankrupted so many hospitals. They were. Uh, they, uh, they, uh, Mr Speaker, we, what we're doing instead is building 48 new hospitals. Yes, we are. Uh, thanks to the thanks to the coloss the biggest capital investment programme in the history of the NHS. Uh, and, and we, we put, uh, from memory, we put 33 billion pounds as soon as we came in. Then another 92 uh, to cope with the pandemic, plus another 39 billion in the health and care levy. They opposed. They opposed that funding. They opposed the health and care levy. They don't have a leg to stand on. We're building the foundations of our NHS's, our, our health services future, and they should support it. Prete well, pretending, Mr. Speaker, pre pre pretending no rules for broke. Prime Minister, he chunters on. Pretending no rules were broken didn't work. Pretending the economy is booming didn't work. And pretending to build 40 new hospitals won't work either. They want him to change, but he can't. As always with this Prime Minister, when he's falling short, he just changes the rules and lowers the bar. In March, he proposed changing the NHS contract. He wants to double the length of time patients can be made to wait for surgery, from one year to two years. On top of that, he scrapped zero tolerance of 12-hour waits at A&E. 24 hours at A&E used to be a TV programme. Now it's his policy. Well, it's Health Week, and he, he's telling all of them... Order! <laughs> Mr. Cleverley, we've got a tea party gathering. I'm sure you don't want to be part of it. I will hear the question. The problem is, so do our constituents. I wonder if I were you, and I think one or two of you might be going early. What it would say is, look, I need to hear the question in the same way I expect to hear the answer. So please, Keir Starmer. Mr. Speaker, I, I bet they wish they were this organised on Monday. Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, it's Health Week, and he's telling them he's going to turn over a new leaf. So why doesn't he start by scrapping his plans to green light wanting an inadequate NHS standards? I do think, Gloria, though, that Keir Starmer's two stories at the end, the personal stories of constituents, mm. was quite effective, actually, in that NHS argument. Though you could argue, I think, that if you really wanted Keir Starmer to sow seeds of discontent within the Conservative Party, he probably should have gone on the economy today. That forecast from the OECD suggesting that the British economy is uh, set to be the worst in the G20 apart from Russia will hurt Boris Johnson and ignite that big argument about how to deal with it, not least of all tax cuts, which many Conservative MPs want to see. Darren McCaffrey, thank you, as ever. Up next, it is On the Money with Liam Halligan, and he's here. What's coming up? We are talking, Gloria, about levelling up the government's flagship mm. policy. You will know more than anyone here at GB News the importance of spreading prosperity to the Midlands, to the north of England, to Scotland and Wales, away from London and the South East, where so much prosperity is. Turns out the Public Accounts Committee, the most influential yes. committee in, in Parliament, has dismissed this flagship policy as just a slogan. We'll also be talking to the Government's Small Business Commissioner, Liz Barclay. Brilliant. You have been watching or listening to The Briefing with me, Gloria De Piero. Join me again tomorrow at 12. Now it's time for your weather. Hi there, I'm Ada McGiven from the Met Office. Another fine day to come for the far north of Scotland. Showers elsewhere across the UK with more prolonged rain for some. 
Mostly that will be just north of the central belt as a slow moving weather front moves north and then effectively stalls through the rest of the day. To the south of that front, extensive showers breaking out across the UK. Northern Ireland, southern Scotland, northern England seeing slow moving showers with some places seeing large amounts of rainfall totals in a short space of time. Could be tricky travelling conditions. To the south again, a keen breeze pushing the showers through. Sunny spells in between those showers. The odd rumble of thunder is possible in some of the livelier downpours, but with the sunshine in between, feeling pleasant enough. 18 to 22 Celsius or 23 in the south. Mid to high teens further north, but feeling cool where we've got the extensive cloud for eastern parts of Scotland. The far north of Scotland stays dry throughout the day and into the evening and overnight. But an area of rain just about affects Northern Ireland, southern Scotland and northwest England through the night time. Clear spells further south again and a bright start to the day for Wales, the southwest, the Midlands, East Anglia and the southeast. It does turn cloudy from the west through the day, some outbreaks of rain affecting Northern Ireland, Wales and the southwest by late morning. Not much rain, but it will be cloudy and damp in these areas. Brighter skies further east, but still a few showers for eastern Scotland, the far northeast of England as well. But feeling warm in the sunshine in the east, 18 to 21 Celsius. Not so warm as the cloud and rain in the west continues and the wind picks up later Thursday. And that's the main theme, I think, Thursday night going into Friday and indeed Saturday. Strengthening wind, breezy for everyone, but the strongest winds will affect northwest Scotland with the risk of gales for exposed coasts. And it's across western Scotland and Northern Ireland where we'll also see frequent showers. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices. With honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, in that the left fights the right and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was in fact a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fat naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. <laughs> yeah. We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no sense.